versions of the prototype. At least, let me count my head, at least four more? I, these probably will go a little quicker than the other ones. I know I've been promising that, but I think that's really true this time. The last example that we gave was called absolute positioning. And with absolute positioning, you pin down. The third one's yeah, the third one's a charm, right. With absolute positioning, you pin something down to a particular location on the page. All right? Uh, I may have said on the screen before, but actually on the page is more accurate. Because we look at this, where are we going? As we scroll, the position changes. So the position is tied to the page and not to the, um, not to the um, screen itself. That should become obvious when we look at the difference between absolute and fixed positioning. All right, so this is our prototype two. And if we were to look at it, The things on the screen have an X and a Y position. Um, not X and Y, but top and left. That's pretty much X and Y uh, from, from like algebra. Whereas X of uh, left is horizontal, Y is, why do you keep saying X and Y? Well, our top is from the top, left is from the left. And if we look at this, um, the page looks like this. If we were to look at the CSS for this, we'll see that we, associate each of these with a specific location. So we give a top, position absolute top and left. That's the top and left of, again, the page. The nav has a position top and left. All the way down the line, each of the, each of the main elements. Notice that I don't really do much with the positioning inside the elements. So like the header has we view the HTML in the header. The header has in it a paragraph, an image, an H1, a paragraph, and so on. I don't worry about positioning those elements. Those elements can just be within the flow layout, within that element that gets positioned. So one thing that I think is a good guideline is don't try to over control and over position every single HTML element. Position the main blocks. And within the main block, for the most part, things can just go in the flow. All right? So I position the header, the nav, the section, and the footer. And this is what we get. Notice if we, if we scroll it, it, the page moves. And again, it stays absolute according to the top of the page, not the top of the window. So fixed is different than that. All right, let's go and let's copy this one, which is just the which is just the flow version, and we're going to make it so that the navigation stays constant as the rest of the page scrolls around. So we have this page that looks like this, and we can scroll it. 
it might be nice to put the navigation here and have the navigation so that as we scroll, it, go, it, it, it stays in the same spot. All right? So as we scroll, it doesn't scroll off the screen. All right? And that is fixed positioning. And for fixed positioning, we're going to do this. I'm going to get rid of I'm going to change the margin to be 200 pixels on the left. And I'll do that for everything to start out. And if we do that, our page looks similar to what it did before. But 200 pixels to the left is, it won't adjust itself if the page resizes. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my navigation alongside here. And I'm going to make it so the navigation doesn't move. So what I'm going to say is, for the navigation, I'm going to say, I'm going to give it a position of fixed as opposed to absolute and I'm going to say top 10 pixels left 10 pixels and I'm going to give it a width of 150 pixels. Now when I do this, I need to make the LI's block tags again. So I'll do that. Now when we view it, oh, navigation's almost where we want it to be, but we want the navigation over. I must have forgot to change something on the margin. I didn't want to take off the margin left 200 pixels. Okay. Um, let's see. Margin left. Oh, yeah, I, I did want to take out the margin left 200 pixels. My, my mistake. So, yeah, I take out the margin left. There we go. Now, as we scroll, it stays stuck in that place. Yeah, I like that a lot, too, especially with navigation. Uh, and the idea is that um, this is different than absolute because with absolute, as you scroll, the things stay absolute according to the top of the page. This is fixed as fixed with regards to the top of the screen. So you're right. It's Monday morning. I'm kind of foggy. I wanted to get rid of that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Pardon the pun. Uh, the only difference I did is I put a uh, position fixed. And then that top and left is re in relation to the screen top, not the page top. So it's 10 pixels from the top and uh, 10 from the left.
one thing I think uh, I want to show is, granted, all these pages are relatively simple, all right? But the CSS to do the positioning and all that isn't very extensive. It's not like they are some crazy convoluted CSS with thousands of lines of code. That's largely because I'm only interested in positioning the main elements. And I'm doing a little tweaking besides that. OK. The next example I'm going to do, that, that's, about, that's about all we can talk about for fixed. Uh, some extreme, one second. Some extremely old browsers don't implement fixed, and they implement it the same as absolute. If it does, then your navigation scrolls with you, and it's not that big a deal. Go ahead. Uh -huh. um, the example that we had is for defining um, as soon as the key wouldn't count, for example, more than one section. Suppose that you had two sections and you wanted to define that in CSS, would you have to set up a class at that point in time? If, if, you want to treat, if you want to treat two sections differently, you're right. You can't use a selector. Okay. Uh, you can't use a section as a selector. You'd have to use a class or an ID. OK, next thing we're going to do is relative position. And relative position is, is different than the other positions. The other positions, when you give a position to something, it takes it out of the flow. So if you remember, we had that example early on where we had things overlapping each other. If I, for example, I'll do this temporarily. If I go in and don't put a position on the footer, if I don't put a position on the footer, then it's going to essentially overlap. The reason for this is if I put an absolute fixed or fixed position, it takes the thing out of the flow. When we study float, the same thing. And when we study grid, it'll be the same thing. Relative doesn't interrupt the flow. All right? Relative doesn't interrupt the flow. So what I can do is I can do this. I'm going to go in and edit the CSS. I'm going to get rid of the position on the footer, which, oh, I'm sorry. We're going to get rid of the position on the nav. So I don't have any positions anywhere. So everything is in the flow. This, in other words, is back what we had with example one. Huh, maybe. Oh, I forgot to put the margin. On this. Okay, so this is more or less what we had with the original one. As soon as I restore the other properties, I deleted. All right, so we're back to that. 
That's more or less the first example again. The only difference is these are oriented vertically instead of horizontally. I'm going to use relative positioning to do this. I'm going to use relative positioning to get this kind of look on the page. The similar to what I had with fixed. All right. I don't like relative positioning, but I want to show it to you. So you can look at it and use it. When you say relative positioning, the browser decides where it wants to put the element, and then it uses your parameters to adjust it. OK? So if I want this kind of look, and my screen looks like this, what do I want to do? I want to put this up and to the right. So I want to push it up and push it from the left to the right. Push it from the bottom to the top. Push it from the left to the right. That's what I want to do with this piece of it. So I'm going to go make the width of this, let's say 150 pixels. And I'm going to say that section, I'm going to give a position relative. I want to push it towards the top, so I put a negative number in for the top. And I want to push it to the left, so I'll give a positive number for the left. So I'm just sort of guessing this. So we'll see how it is and I'll adjust it. Yeah. All right. So now when we do that, eh, it's kind of how I want it. All right, let's make this a little smaller. Yes. Let's get rid of that. All right. And it looks like the left is okay with this. I want to push it up a bit, so I'll do a bigger negative number. Too big of a negative number. All right. Then I will push up the head of the footer a little bit by giving it a position relative and a top. say that. I want that on the footer. All right, and I could fiddle with this a little bit. To maybe make the margin And maybe make the width of some of these a little bigger. And yeah, we're close to what I had wanted. I'd probably need to make that a little wider to make it exactly the way I wanted, but I don't feel like fiddling with that right now. OK, here's the point. The point is, is there's two things on the page I put the relative positioning for. The rest go along with the flow. 
All right, the rest continue to be in the flow position, one thing right after another. So the relative doesn't really interrupt the flow. It still figures out where it's going to put something and puts it there. Unless, but you can tweak where it puts it. This to me seems very fragile. By fragile, I mean if I make a change of something, if I add more content or whatever, then uh, I might have to monkey with it again to, to get it uh, exactly the way I want it to be. So I don't really like this. But again, I figured I should show it to you because there might be a time when it comes in handy or you might see other people's code that does this. And you shouldn't be totally confused about what that does. Uh, I won't say they move around better, they move around differently. Uh, you, can, you, can then, you can move things and make adjustments to push it up or down. And you can do the same thing with a negative margin, too, uh, rather than a negative uh, x and y. There we go, we'll leave it at that. But again, I generally avoid using relative, but I figure that we should at least look at relative examples. All right, the next one is one of the more confusing ones. All right, so we'll spend, we'll spend a fair amount of time on it. And the next one is called floating. Before we go into the prototype example, I'm going to make a, a, a separate web page, and I'm going to put the CSS on the same page just so that we can look at everything all at once. Again, that doesn't mean you should put everything in the, in the web page. It's still better to have an external CSS file. But I'm going to put it in a separate file. I'm going to keep it in the same file for now just so that I don't have to switch back and forth between screens and we can see it more easily. So I'm going to make a page. This isn't really a prototype. This is going to be our float example. And I'm going to get rid of everything but the index. And even the index, I'm going to get rid of most of the stuff. And I'm going to do this with two sections in this example. But it doesn't have to be sections, all right? It can be anything. It can be any block tag that I'm doing this for. So I'm going to do it with sections, but it could be uh, any block tag. And I'm first going to go, and I'm going to make my two sections. And it's going to contain a paragraph of Greek text. Okay, let's, I'm going to make two sections, and no style whatsoever, so we should know how this looks, All right? They'll be just stacked right on top of each other because they're block tags. So there they are. Let's start putting some properties on these. So I'm going to go into style, and again, I'm going to include this.
and we give each one of these sections an ID. Again, the difference between class and ID, a class is something that you could potentially have more than one thing like it on a page. So you want to treat it the same way. And that's very important in most CSS styling because you want to typically style similar things the same way. If you have two headlines of the same importance, they should look the same. All right. If you have two warnings on your page, all your warnings should look the same. So you assign a class to it. An ID is where there's only one thing on the page that's like it. All right. And for demonstration here, I'm using an ID. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to say, I'm not going to do the ID at first, but I'm going to say section. This is going to apply to all sections, right? Because we can mix and match these selectors. I can have a selector for section and then a selector for section one. And it will get a combination of both properties. Let's give a background. Let's do this. Let's give a border of 0px, a margin of 10, 10px. Let's give a border of 5px black solid a margin of 10px and a padding of 5px. These are the standard CSS box style properties. Border, margin, and padding. I don't know why I did 110. Let's just do 100. <laughs> Odd, choice. Odd choice. OK, so let's go and let's look at these. So boom. Let's make the margin a little smaller. Let's make it 30. All right. Let's make a few observations before we get to floating here. All right. Number one, there's 30 pixels from the left, right, top. Are there 30 or 60 pixels between the two of them? 30. 30. Is that correct? Well, yeah, it's correct. But you might think that there should be 60, right? Because if you have this guy with a bottom margin of 30 and this guy with a top margin of 30, you might think that those two should add together and you'll get 60 pixels between them. But you don't. This is called margin collapsing. When you say something has a margin, you're just saying, hey, I want, these, I want this guy to have nothing within 30 pixels of its bottom. And you're also saying, hey, I want this guy to have nothing within 30 pixels of its top. So a space of 30 pixels satisfies both of those things. All right? That keeps the bottom one from getting within 30 pixels of the top one, and it keeps the top one from getting within 30 pixels of the bottom one. If one had 50? One had 50? Yeah. Then well, which satisfies both of those conditions? The 50 does. So the 50 would make sure there's nothing within 30 pixels of it. All right? And, the, um, and then the 50 would make sure there's nothing within 50 of the other one. OK. So if I give a width to one of these, and I'm going to start out giving an absolute number as a width, 500, let's say 300 pixels. How much space 
do each of these take up? You got 700, 700 pixels in your uh, end to the, your paragraph all the way to the end of the page. Okay. Because you're using right now 300, 300. Right, I would have approximately 700 left, right. But how much does a section take up? Remember that when you talk about the space of a section, if I did this, the question was how much does it take up? You have to take the amount of text. So the width of something, the width of a box on the screen is the margin, the left margin, the border width, and it's kind of hard to make it wider, but I'll try. The border width, so the margin plus border plus the padding. Margin, remember, is the space between elements. The border is the border around it. Padding is the space between the edge of the element and where the data starts. This is the width. And then I have the same thing on the next side the padding, the border, and the margin. So, to calculate this, the left margin is 5. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, the left margin is 30. The left border is 5. The padding is 5. The width is 300. The right padding is 5. The right border is 5. And the right margin is 30. So that would be... 40 plus 300 is 340 plus 350, 380. So this takes up 380 spaces. 380 pixels, rather. So you only got 620. Right. The point is, is you have to count that. You have to keep that in mind when you're, when you're planning out spaces. And that especially becomes important when we come to floating. Because we'll see an example where we could make each of these take up 50% and they won't be able to fit side by side, right? Why? Well, because 50% is just this width. When you add the padding and border and margin to it, you get more than that. All right, I'm going to now give each of these their own background color so we can follow them because we're going to make them move around the screen a little bit. So I'm going to say, give me the thing that has an ID of section 1, and let's give it a background of yellow. And let's look at the thing called section 2. And let's give it a background of blue. So the one I'm making yellow with a, a, a blue text, the one I'm making blue with a yellow text. That's all in the HTML right there, right? Okay, the first one is section, section ID equals section 2, background blue, color yellow. I 
I have the ID and the closing tag of the section. It'll get you every time. You don't put any properties in the closing tag, just the opening tag. So there we go. Okay, so there's our two things. And I've made them different colors so that you can tell which is which. All right. So now we're going to float things. All right. I'm going to float these to the left. All right. What does that mean? It means if there's space to put it on the same line as the thing to the left, do it. Otherwise, drop it onto its new line. Now, this is the very first thing, right? So, of course, there's space for it. So if I say float left, it's going to put it pretty much in this position. If I say float left with this, the browser's going to look to see if there's enough space to put it side by side. If there is, then it will put it right alongside of it. If not, it will drop it below. Now, in this case, what's going to happen? When the screen is big, there's going to be enough space, right? So it will put it alongside. As I make the screen smaller, there's going to be a point where there's not enough space for it. Like when the screen gets to be up to the screen being 760 pixels, there's enough space to put them side by side, right? Because I have two things that are 380 pixels each. So if the screen's 1,000 pixels, I can put 760 in 1,000. If the screen is 900, 800, 770, all the way down to 760, at the point that the screen becomes 759 pixels, it can no longer put them side by side. It doesn't have enough room. So it will drop it below. So this is what I mean. So I'm going to go on both of these, and I'm going to say float left. Floating also takes it out of the flow. So generally speaking, when you start messing with the positions of things, you have to mess with all your main sections and giving them a position. Because otherwise, some of the, some of the uh, block tags will just go with the flow. So. If you only put flow, what can happen? It will ignore it because you have to say float. You have to either specify float left, float top float right, float bottom. Typically, you do float left. So the screen right now is approximately 1,000 pixels wide, give or take. As I start narrowing it, yeah, it can still fit them in. Oops. Can still fit them in. Can still fit them. At a certain point, though, when I hit the edge of the margin of 30 pixels, boom, can no longer fit it in. So it will make it side by side. Let's make it more apparent by putting zero margin in. Those two are right next to each other. When it literally hits that point, it will put it in there. Let's get rid of all the margin on the page. And let's say body margin zero pick. So now it's right up on that corner. They're right up on top of each other with no space in between them. So literally, it will go until I, my window, hits the, the border. Boom, and there it pops down. Now, at first, when you hear floating, it kind of like, OK, that's cool, but is that particularly useful? As it turns out, actually, it is, all right? It's useful for handling pages that have different screen sizes, mon uh, or, or devices that have different screen sizes, monitor sizes. And that especially becomes port important when you have uh, mobile devices, which we'll be getting into shortly. Now, um, typically, you want your mobile designs to be simpler than your desktop designs. If you notice, when you visit mobile websites, very often they're a single column. All right? And what that will do is that will just make sure that the things stack right on top of each other. It is possible 
if you have a simple enough page that you can use one set of CSS that can handle both a device, mobile device like a phone or a tablet, and a laptop or computer if you write the good enough CSS. Yes? Um, you can do it. Uh, there's a couple ways you can do it. There's actually an Opera mobile emulator that you can download. You can also click on this if you're running Google Chrome. Pick more tools, developer tools, and you can say that you want to be able to choose the device. And like this is an iPhone 6 and so on. Yeah, well, just, I got that menu, but I don't know right. where to click. I was like, right. oh, I don't know where to go. All right. Now, I'm going to go put the margins back in, now that we demonstrated that. That was pretty. Yeah, and we, and we can do a lot of stuff from there. There's all kinds of things you can mix and match. So, for example, I'm going to say that this one has a width of 50 percent and this one has a width of 200 pixels. So this almost becomes an algebra problem, right? This one takes up 50 percent of the page, this one takes up well, let me rephrase that, because that's not completely correct. This one takes up 50% of the page plus the margin, the borders, and so on. So 50% plus 80 pixels this guy takes up. So it actually takes up more than 50%. Well, uh, again, you're right if you're assuming that the, the full screen is 1,000 pixels, but you can't always assume that, all right? Uh, this is going to be, what did I say, 200 pixels plus the 80 pixels. So this is 280. So there will be a point, and you could figure it out using algebra, <laughs> all right, that when you hit a certain point, boom, it's going to push that down below. Yeah. These kind of layouts are sometimes called liquid layouts because the content sort of conforms itself to the shape, the size, the dimensions of the, um, of the window. Things can get even more complicated if you put like a minimum width there. So I can say minimum width 400 pixels. All right? which means that it will take up at least, it will take up 50% plus 80, but if that number becomes lower than 400, if the width part of it becomes lower than 400, it will actually be 480, right? Because you're still going to add on the padding and the margin and the border. there it does it at a certain point here that's going to stop getting smaller and boom then that's going to pop down again because I've given a minimum width it will there'll be a point which it won't contract anymore it can be very confusing I guess when you start mixing uh, absolute numbers like 200 and percentages. All right? If it were done in absolute, well, you wouldn't have absolute. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't have an absolute positioning info. Absolute was a poor choice of words on my part. Um, what I meant was when you mix number numbers and percentages, when you mix pixels and percentages is probably the best way to put it, that that can be confusing. 
because, again, like I said, becomes an algebra problem. All right. This is a basic concept of floating. You can float all four directions, top, bottom, right, left. But typically, left is what I usually use. And it just makes the most sense to explain it that way. If I were, for example, to float this to the right, it would work almost the same. You don't have to, but it gets really confusing if you don't. Okay. Then it'll be the same thing, except the, the second one is to the left of that instead of to the right. And then it goes down below. If I were to do this, make one float left and one float right, sort of goes the same way, but that drops down below to the right part of the screen as opposed to the left part of the screen. All right, this is the basics of floating. What we'll do next time is we will talk about actually like making this work with an actual web page and not just an example like this. Uh, I will then talk about the grid layout, which is a new um, addition to CSS. Um, that really has some really cool features in. Um, we will then uh, talk about styling for creating designs that work both on a desktop and a mobile device. We'll take the stuff that we've learned about CSS and CSS positioning and apply them to that problem. How can I make a page look one way on a mobile device, another way on a desktop device, or look good on both of them? So that's probably what we'll cover, we'll probably get through most, if not all of that, on Wednesday, but that's the next couple of topics that you'll have. All right, see you in lab. That's the one very important, too. It's really, really important. Because uh, uh, that's when you make your money, if you don't look good in your phone, it, people are going to buy your app. Exactly. Or whatever. Oh, it's just knowing. Really? No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I want to see everybody's face. <laughs> I would no, I'd be I'd be thrilled. Hey, I would be like yeah.